So uh, we're going to we're going to conduct these uh, this interview the way that we normally do. I'll, I'll um, conduct a formal interview for the first 45 minutes or so, and then I'll unmute the lines. I'll <coughs> take care of muting and unmuting, and then people can ask their own questions. So let me go ahead and unmute. Uh, Farouk, can you still hear me? Yes, of course. Okay, very good. And uh, everyone else, I assume, is uh, can can still hear me as well. So, uh, Farouk, first of all, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your extremely busy schedule to join us again for another one of these teleconference calls. Your your generosity with regards to these calls is... Oh, thank you. So it's my privilege. Well, no, uh, I mean, you have been extremely, extremely generous having to call from India and, you know, different numbers. And, of course, last uh, uh, last week the call was canceled because we had an electrical blowout. So, uh, again, thank you for just your graciousness in doing thank this. Thank you so much. Um, let me let me just say that you know for those of you who don't know uh, Dr. Master, uh, Dr. Master um, is uh, one of the great homeopaths, one of the great treasures that we have in homeopathy. He's uh, currently affiliated with the Hahnemann College of Homeopathy in uh, the UK and Canada, and also the L- London College of Homeopathy in uh, Great Britain. Um, he teaches all over the world. He's a professor of homeopathic materia medica at the Homeopathic Medical College in Bombay. He's authored over 40 books on uh, various homeopathic subjects. His most current book, which is uh, the homeopathic treatment of uh, children, uh, the cl- clinical observations, uh, is absolutely, uh, in my estimation, the single best book we have on the homeopathic treatment of children. Uh, he's also the author of many, many other works. Uh, he's currently the editor of the Homeopathic Heritage in India. Uh, he's a member of the Central Council of Homeopathy and Ministry of Health and Welfare for the Government of India. And, you know, all of these, you know, he's a medical doctor, he's a great homeopath. All of this, uh, believe me when I say, doesn't even begin to give you a sense of what an amazing human being uh, Dr. Master. And he's a very humble fellow, so I know he's blushing on the other, line, <laughs> other side of the line when I'm saying this, but it really is very true. I mean, since the first day that I've met him, until now, he he has been one of the most genuine, um, high-level integrity, giving human beings that I've ever met in my entire life. Everyone in my staff loves him. He treats everyone with the same level of, of respect. If you go to India, everyone around him treats him with the greatest reverence because he is so big-hearted, and his real concern is to help others, and it, it shines through that his patients love him, the students who, who study with him love him, everybody loves him. He's, he's totally humble, full of humility, and on top of that, he's one of the great geniuses that we have in homeopathy. His, mas- his mastery of the repertory is unparalleled. His knowledge of materia medica is inc- unbelievable, and he also gets amazing results in practice for those of people who've had a, a, the opportunity to go to his seminars and see the results that he gets in front of uh, others is, and, and in his own practice day-to-day is just amazing. So uh, we are really honored, and, uh, I, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the call. Thank you. Um, okay, so, Farouk, you, of course, you, you suggested the subject of um, – homeopathy and the treatment of advanced pathological cases. And I, I wanted to know if you could just be very clear and specify for us what exactly you mean by advanced pathological <coughs> See, when the disease process has uh, expanded, producing uh, irreversible uh, changes in the structures of vital organs of the body, that is what we usually call as uh, advanced pathological changes, you know changes that cannot be revert back to normalcy. The structures have been uh, damaged so badly that the original architecture of the organ does, just does not exist, like a hypertrophy of the heart or cirrhotic changes in the liver or fibrosis in the lungs, like emphysematous condition in the lungs. These are the advanced pathological changes. And, and Farouk, can you uh, give us some ideas for specific diseases that you would label? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> See, if you start basically uh, from uh, the uh, from some common things which I see in my day-to-day practice, you know, as you know, most of my time I spend in hospital practice. So we see many cases of uh, acute respiratory failure, hemoptysis, uh, acute angina pectoris, acute dysrhythmias in the heart, septicemias. Uh, meningitis, uh, acute bout of uh, hypertension, renal failure, uh, hepatic coma, 
cerebral concussion, you know, or treating a very advanced cancer with uh, extensive metastasis all over the body. These are the some of the common cases that we see in, in India in my hospital practice. Mm. Now I know cirrhosis must be a little um a little frightening for some people here because you know mostly in North America the homeopaths don't uh, treat that severity of uh, of cases. Um I'm curious and I'm sure the 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 people listening are also curious uh what type of success are you getting with these very advanced Yeah, cases? this is a very important thing. Uh, <coughs> if you just look at it we also in India have a many medical legal problem treating uh, such very advanced pathological cases only with homeopathy. But here, basically, <clears throat> I have no other choice left because I see these people dying with allopathic medicine where allopathic medicine just cannot help these patients to come out of this situation completely. And hence, I usually try and uh, use homeopathic drugs to bring out from their uh, situation and... and uh, People do give me a good support. <coughs> the hospital management does give me a good support. We have a full-time homeopathic department in Bombay Hospital since 23 years now. And uh, we do get a chance and uh, the results are quite good. Sometimes when you feel that the person is going to die and you try to give him even some relief to the patient, even so let's say some palliation. And I think so that also counts in homeopathy to relieve somebody of his symptoms without curing. So my aim has never been to cure somebody with an advanced pathological changes. My aim always has been to give palliation, to give him better quality of life so that the man lives with dignity and if he has to even die, he has to die with dignity. And I assume sometimes you, you're surprised though and uh, yeah. trying for palliation. Yeah, and, and some cases do come out, you know, and then yeah. it's very mind-boggling that how homeopathic drugs can act in such an advanced situation. Mm. The condition is not that what I cure, I want to show to the world. I want to show to the world that the homeopathic drugs do act. Mm. So maybe they can try those same drugs even in a cases which are not so pathologically advanced and they will still get the results. Mm. Mm. So Farouk, you know, I know when you take these cases, sometimes there's a lot of difficulties and obstacles. The patient uh, is not able to speak because, you know, he, he's on a respirator or, you know, they, they're delirious or they, their mind isn't working properly. And yes. Are there any tips or ideas that you can yes, give yes, yes, about yes. taking Yes, yeah, yeah. What I would say is that first, <coughs> if you are going to accept such advanced uh, pathological cases, there are certain responsibilities on homeopathy, you know. He should have a very sharp acumen, a good memory, a good self-confidence, good knowledge of homeopathic materia medica, including the rarer remedies, good knowledge of the repertories, especially the modern repertories, and he should have. It should be a good uh, knowledge of clinical bedside medicine, how to examine the patient. Then, <coughs> the most important thing over here, once you see such patients, because as they are fairly advanced, they may not talk. There are many tubes in the mouth especially the oxygen one or from the respirator one and there will be a Riles tube in the mouth to feed them so patient even can't talk with you properly. In such a case we start basically by just observing the basic vital uh, signs of the person the, the respiration, the pulse, the blood pressure, the rate, the rhythm, the pattern of respiration, the degree of chest expansion, the temperature, the central venous pressure, the moisture of the skin, moisture, uh, the nails, we try and examine the uh, mucous membrane of the uh, person, you know, in the mouth. We carefully examine the lung, the heart. All these are important, I tell you, because they have direct or indirect representation in our repertory and, of course, then into the Materia Medica. But, uh, unfortunately, I, we see that many homeopaths don't examine the patients. And uh, by examining the patient, you come to know a lot. And uh, there are chapters written, like in the Kent's repertory, there are about 82 rubrics on respirations, various types of respiration. In the chapter of generalities under pulse, there are 56 types of pulse described in Kent's repertory. So why not take advantage of those chapters and uh, those rubrics and, and, and you know, try to compare the clinical situation with this 
rubrics and maybe we can come to the remedy. Then I try to even examine the x-ray chest, the blood gas analysis report. That also helps me. And uh, <clears throat> after doing this uh, basic uh, examination, I start my, uh, my observation by observing the facial expression. This is very important in the Kent repertory under the chapter of face you see about 30 types of facial expression whether the expression is pale or whether the expression is haggard or whether the expression is vacant or whether the expression is of suffering or whether the expression is of fright all these expressions are extremely important to understand then we examine the eyes then we examine the position of the head how he moves the head the head lies in which position then the type and pattern of respiration whether there is any froth in the mouth or not, is there a cyanosis, is there an involuntary movement of any part of the body, are there any particular parts of the body excessively hot or excessively cold to touch, are there any perspiration on specific parts. Now if you open the chapter on perspiration, you will see that partial perspiration or perspiration on only one hand or perspiration on only one leg or perspiration on the right side, perspiration on the upper half of the body, lower half of the body, Discoloration of any part, you know, whether the certain parts are brown, black, red, green, whatever you may call. So you should examine all those things also. And then, <clears throat> after examining, giving a general checkup to the person, we can, uh, we have to assess that uh, what is the exact presenting phenomena in a person's uh, uh, symptomatology. You can even, even give importance to the intake and output of the person, whether the person's urine is less or whether the urine is more, you know, or the stool examination can also tell you uh, quite a lot of things. <clears throat> and then you try to find out the pathology. What is the ongoing pathology? Is the person having a severe uh, hemorrhage into the brain that has led to the paralysis of the body or is there a massive cardia, myocardial infection, infarction that has produced this type of pathology or is there a huge septicemia that has produced because we have got direct pathological rubrics also in the repertory. So to find those direct pathological rubrics also, we try to correlate this type of situation. Once you have overcome this and remedy has acted or person is in little better state of mind to talk with you or you can get some symptoms from the patient, then this is excellent. Then you try and collect more data, try and understand the more background symptoms of the patient like his past history, family history, his mental symptoms, who is he, where does he come from, why is he sick, what has really caused this whole situation. Maybe then if you get more data, then you have to select your medicine more on those data. And then, you know, you have to walk one step after another after another. But immediately when you see a person in an emergency, it is very difficult to assess and go through a very classical approach of homeopathy. You cannot apply at that time. At that time, it is very important to save the life of the person than to go into all these details. It's like somebody is falling down from the 20th floor and he falls down on the ground, bleeding quite a lot. It is stupid to ask him further question whether you have fallen from the 18th floor or 19th floor. It makes no difference. At that time, we have to concentrate on the bleeding and give him some remedy which is anti-hemorrhagic in character in homeopathy and stop his bleeding. And then maybe we can find out whether it was a suicide or a homicide or an accident or something like that, you know. So this is how I work. You know, Farouk, I think it's so valuable for you to uh, uh, describe the, the repertory like that and all the things that you're looking for because I think it gives people a sense of really how open you have to be to to perceive every subtle change in that person as a as a possible you know clue to lead us to a, a remedy that's going to help that case. Um, you know, I know as you mentioned, these you use a lot of words like haggard face and. And I, I'm sure that a lot of um, the people listening are, are wondering, actually, for example, what does Haggard uh, uh, mean or what does, what does this rubric mean? And there's a lot of rubrics in there uh, that have words that we don't use any longer. And I know that you've taught seminars where you've gone through it step by step and explained those. Uh, is there any other way that people could learn uh, the, the different rubrics in the repertory? Is there, is there some place where they could uh, uh, really learn this information? 
the best of course thing is to have the right repertory i would recommend the synthesis repertory mm-hmm. as a very important tool and uh, i would also recommend nair repertory these are the two repertories which i work with usually and of course i work with the program radar all the time it's a part of my life and uh, <coughs> when you open the repertory you have to also study the meanings of such rubrics from the medical dictionary <coughs> that is the stedman's medical dictionary which is a very standard dictionary and if you want to find the english word general webster's dictionary was the one which can't used to use so i use webster's dictionary also and the combination of these dictionaries will really help you to understand the real meaning uh, behind this and and this cannot be achieved in one day all these things sure. you know it, it's a it's a learning uh, process you know <clears throat> i'll tell you how i started it was in 76 when i was taking rounds as a medical student you know 1976 and uh, <clears throat> i was just learning homeopathy i was not a very good student of homeopathy at that time as you know my birth in homeopathy was by breach presentation i was not delivered normally in homeopathy because i had to study the modern medicine for some time so we had a case of an old man you know and uh, he was in coma and he used to choke to death regularly because of the excessive secretion in the lungs you know and the doctors used to give all the various medicines by intravenous drips and nothing will happen to control the secretion you know and in <clears throat> those days uh, i was very inquisitive to find out get whether homeopathy can help or not and i tried various remedies of course after seeking the permission of the patient and the concerned doctor and he says you do if you homeopathy can show some results and then <clears throat> i had a very nice book of uh, margaret tyler you know and margaret tyler they mentions a very nice medicine known as solanum asiaticum and solanum asiaticum she writes it is very good remedy for the excessive congestion in the lungs leading to paralysis of the lungs but this is exactly what the patient was suffering from and solanum asiaticum was used by me in 6c potency and i told the wife that you ask the nurse to give this medicine in just few drops two drops four times a day five times a day as many times you can give in seven days the secretion of that man was much better which could not be controlled for many many months you know so That's this is story. yeah so this is how you can pick up the things if you read regularly sure. and uh, this this rubric this drug has been now incorporated in our synthesis repertory mm-hmm. under the rubric so i am so happy mm. that uh, yeah then and 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 many such cases i can quote you know where the beginning was on a very small note you know the intention was never to cure the patient mm. the intention was only to relieve some symptoms also of a person where we know that person is ultimately going to die mm. in coma you know mm. but 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 even helping five person in such patient is human sure. i feel sure i totally agree yeah For real, getting back to um, the, the advanced case subject, uh, we talked a little bit about how you know how we would would take take the case. What would be different once you have the information and you have to analyze it? Are there any things that you need to consider differently when yeah. specifically uh, addressing advanced cases? Yeah, yeah. See, this is uh, there is always a battle between what you see and what you want. This is very important. What you see basically. is when the patient is brought in front of you and at that time you have to assess that whether it's a very big emergency or it is not an emergency because sometimes you have advanced pathological changes but person is in a fully conscious state and he can talk a lot to you such are the states where you should go in a very classical approach and you should take the history and find out this remedy and constitutional remedy and start prescribing in fact i have got loads of cases where i have only treated a person with a constitutional remedy especially the chronic renal failures you know we have a huge population of chronic renal failures in bombay and people who can't afford hemodialysis we maintain their creatine levels and urea levels under control purely with homeopathic medicine and these people can talk you know so we try to treat them in a very very classical way but there are certain people <coughs> like these people of comas who come with cerebrovascular accident or cerebral uh, infarction or cerebral hemorrhage or 
subarachnoid hemorrhage these are the people who directly present to you with severe convulsions or with very deep coma these patients cannot talk now in such patients you have to take a different approach that you start examining the patient look at the clinical symptom observe the pathological data if there is there are any look into the scan examine whatever i have told you in the initial stage and try to derive something once you derive a remedy on those indication wait and watch and see whether the picture changes or not and once the picture changes uh, <coughs> you can go to a better remedy i'll give you a good example this is a case about 15 uh, 20 years back uh, when i was working in a neurology department in a hospital i had witnessed this case of a young married girl she committed suicide from a running train you know she jumped from the running train it was the night time and she fractured her skull in a huge hemorrhage unfortunately nobody saw her for 3 hours so she was just lying on the railway track and then somebody some policemen and the security people saw her got her admitted to the hospital and she was in a absolutely deep coma the scans were taken and there was a huge clot lying down they immediately operated upon her but the doctor after the operation said that she won't survive and uh, she cannot be brought out of of deep coma and for one month and 10 days this lady was just lying in the hospital like a vegetable you know and nothing can be achieved you know it was at that stage that uh, i was uh, experimenting on homeopathic remedies in neurological cases that i i i showed my interest to the my teacher and i said sir can i take over the case if you don't mind with homeopathy because you are just giving her some life support medicine that's all and if we can do something you know and my first remedy <laughs> that i uh, started in this uh, particular patient was uh, i was studying a, a remedy known as carbonium hydrogenicetum this was the remedy which uh, strike my mind again, at, say the name of the remedy again it is uh, known as carbonium c a r oh, carbonium okay yeah it is known as carbonium mm-hmm. hydro genicetum okay hmm now <clears throat> what was very important why did they selected this <laughs> out of the whole the uh, armament of homeopathy because this person had a very tight lock jaw you know lock jaw the jaw is very tight because of this spasm of the masseter muscle what we medically call as trismus you know so this particular girl had a very tight uh, lock jaw and uh, she had involuntary stool she had involuntary urine there was a frank case of uh, apoplexy because there was a huge excavation of the blood in the cerebral cavity so these were the three things and then what is most important was the eye you know used to oscillate you know what we call as a nystagmus you know the oscillation of the eyeballs so i had four symptoms of this remedy of course this remedy itself is a very small remedy but i had four strong symptoms of that remedy and with great difficulty i could find the remedy in the market because it's what not a common remedy sure and i used this remedy slowly 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 i started with the 6 then i went to the 30th then i went to the 200 i never knew anything of posology at that time what dose i should give so i just started firing her every 3 to 4 hourly i said you keep on giving till you find the response and on the 10th day we saw the response that the girl opened the eyes for the very first time and everybody the ward sister and the house physician everybody connected oh she is there is some moment there are some moments you know which they had thought that it's a vegetable and she was allowed to die peacefully you know wow. and that is how the hope started the moment the hope started i was given permission to read the history of the lady and interview her husband and uh, interview her brother and everybody and what i found out was a very very traumatic life you know that she was undergone through her marriage was very bad she was abused and uh, she was dominated she was scorned she was reproached she was treated very very badly in her marriage and that was the reason why she wanted to commit a suicide and uh, her husband also had an extra marital affairs and so with all those symptoms i could select hyoscyamus because of uh, i don't remember all the symptoms but these were the real history of that uh, 
lady and plus whatever symptoms are found in carbohydrogenicitum at that time i could see also the same symptoms in a uh, hyoscyamus at that time and hyoscyamus has also got all these uh, neurological uh, symptoms uh. i remember that the pupils were very much uh, dilated that is one very important uh, symptom of uh, there and there was a low as she started gaining more and more of consciousness there was always a low low muttering speech and uh, i remember in boric materia medica under chapter of mind boric has very nicely mentioned deep stupor so the word deep stupor was very important because she was in a deep coma when i saw her also so so there were some things of the uh, hyoscyamus which were quite ringing in my you know brain that this could be the remedy of uh, the person you know and i gave hyoscyamus and within i think so 21 days the girl came out completely out of coma we gave her extensive physiotherapy for 2 and a half to 3 months believe me came this lady is now normal absolutely her marriage is quite okay now and now i think so she is 48 or 49 years old with mother of two children completely recovered out of coma nobody believed the whole story but of course we had documented everything in the hospital and um, this this really turned my eyes towards more into homeopathy that yes homeopathy works even in such cases and since then i had chains of comatose cases how they nicely recover with homeopathic medicine not all but some yes sure well, yeah amazing story for us and yeah incredible um so uh when you have these advanced cases uh, for us do you, are there you know normally we're looking at the at the at the characteristic symptoms you know in the case uh, i know sometimes um at you know end stage pathology we have a lack of symptoms sometimes uh how do you deal with that or is that something that uh, that you just that you find in your practice yeah now we are also as you rightly said that in uh, edwards uh, pathological cases uh, we have a lack of symptom but over a period of years i have also observed and learned one thing from my practices that if we really try to look at the case not once but twice thrice then sometimes we may find something very very unique about the case and you can stumble upon a correct remedy i'll give you an example i had a case of a cancer of the cervix in a young lady now this cervix cancer uh, expanded up involved the whole bladder it went back involved the whole of rectum it went on the sides involved the whole of pelvis and <clears throat> we could not do anything with this lady no operations uh, no chemotherapy and no radiation because it was extensive so the oncologist allowed the person to just take some painkillers and pass on the time you know there was an ascites also the metastases had come into the peritoneum also now her main complaint was severe burning pain and she had multiple fistulas the u the vaginal cavity had joined the rectum the rectal cavity had joined the vagina the bladder had joined the vagina so there was a vasico vaginal and recto vaginal and vasico urethral fistulas so you can understand that if urine tries to enter the you know the fecal path and the the from the vagina the urine comes and the stool comes from the vagina it's extremely extremely painful and you can shout you know so she was in a very high dose of uh, morphine but still even with morphine you cannot control and of course she had a tremendous loss of weight she was like a walking skeleton you know and no appetite severe anemia and all those nutritional problems added to that now i was called upon by her sons to see that i can help this lady with homeopathy because the burning pain the discharges the leucorrhea the the the, the filth used to come that the urine the stool they said give her some peace because she is in agony so i decide to visit her and uh, of course the prognosis has been uh, explained to the family members that nothing no miracles will be performed but our intention basically was to reduce the pain and i tried to find out and what i found out was that this lady was lying on a bed and there was a table fan 
which was kept very close to her thighs. And I said to the son that why your mother wants a fan at that place? They said she wants a lot of air into her vagina. She wants a lot of air near her private organs where there is a severe pain. So this was very apparent that the pain is better by cold air because the fan does give out a cold air. So this was very important, pain better by cold air. Then I tried to ask that what is the type of pain? And they told me that the type of pain that she has is a very burning pain. Well, this was very important for me to know. I think so. I finished my whole history taking by finding this very peculiar thing. Because she was not in a state to even open the mouth, you know, and talk few sentences. So much she was engrossed with her illness and the pain. Immediately my prescription was sickle core because sickle core is one remedy which has got cancer, which has got emaciation, which has got burning pain and the burning pain is better by cold air. So every facet of sickle core was there even at that time. Maybe if sickle core would have given some months back, we could have even treated the cancer. But I could see those characteristic symptoms of sickle core. In three days, her pain, her leukorrhea, her discharge were better by 70%. This is what was very important. On the fourth day, she died. This was a very unique uh, homeopathic palliation that we could see that without curing the patient, uh, you can uh, give palliation. And, and the PQR were existing at the time of death. That was very important. And they were very happy. We could not cure, but uh, they were very happy with the results. Sure. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, Ferg, I know you're always the the, the master of uh, remedies that nobody's ever heard of that uh, are are have these incredibly valuable uses in homeopathic practice. So I was curious if you could maybe share uh, some yeah. small or unproved remedy. Yeah. Or yeah. Remedy I would that request that the listener should tape a paper and a pen in the hand because I'll be discussing about. 15, 16 remedies, depending on the time of interview. Okay, you have so to have shut my mouth if I'm... 10 minutes. Can you do it in 10 minutes? Yes, I can do it. Uh, okay. All right. Well, for, for people on the call, don't worry. This is being recorded. Go ahead, yeah. Farouk. Yeah. Now, uh, <clears throat> I would, uh, over the period of years, I have experimented with many, many small remedies. These remedies are not well proved. And I don't guarantee you that in every patient that you are going to use this remedy, this is going to act. But this will give you uh, enough time to wait for the symptoms to develop more so that you can give a better remedy. But in majority of the patients that you will use this remedy, you will get the results. So I am very clear about this in the very beginning. I am still experimenting in last 23 years with this remedy. Most of the time I use the 6th or the 30th potencies of these rare remedies. The first rare remedy that I would like to start with is Ethylicum. Ethylicum. E-T-H-Y-L-I-C-U-M. You know Ethylicum? Ethylicum is basically nothing but an ethyl alcohol. Wow. Okay. Now, this remedy should be used when there is a strong family history or personal history of alcoholism, number one. And number two, it has to be used in those conditions where the lungs get uh, congested or there is a extensive chronic bronchitis, severe uh, bronchial asthma, capillary bronchitis in infants. This is the remedy I use. I learned this remedy in France where I saw many French homeopaths using this remedy and I saw some famous homeopaths in France like Dr. Didier Grand George using this remedy in his pediatric cases. This was the symptom, the family history of alcoholism. Another remedy which I would like to talk about is Adonidinum. The I will spell for you. It is A D O N I D I N U M. Adonidinum. Now, 
As you all know that people who are suffering from uh, weak contraction, poor contraction of the cardiac muscles, they get exhausted very fast. They get out of breath very fast. And when you do the echocardiogram, you see that the ejection fraction is very, very poor. If anybody's ejection fraction is less than 30%, uh, you suffer from all the symptoms of weakness, exhaustion, fatigue, prostration, on slightest exertion. And then we try to give certain remedies in modern medicine. Of course, the most important is the digitalis, what we call as lenoxin, you know, or digitoxin. But digitalis has its own side effect. If you keep a person on digitalis for a very long time, it, it screws up your liver, it screws up your stomach, it screws up your appetite. And further, you can only use digitalis in a certain dose. In a higher dose, it will exactly act opposite. So you will have a lot of problem with the rhythm of the heart. So this is a phenomena which we see day and night in the department of cardiology. Now, if you have this medicine, which I have just described to you, Edonidinum, this will help you to taper off the digitalis from the person. Believe me, it is one of the best medicine for congestive cardiac failure. It is one of the best medicine in homeopathy where I have seen that the contraction of the ventricles are very poor. Using this medicine makes the contraction very stronger. It prolongs the diastole. In fact, if you want to know the uh, more uh, information of this remedy, you have to read Borix Materia Medica. And, uh, the, and it is, uh, I think so, un given under the remedy Adonis Vernalis. You have to open the remedy Adonis Vernalis and you have to look below under relationship. Maybe you will find this. Another very useful remedy is scallop. I know most of you Americans eat scallops as a food, you know. It's a fish. Yeah. And the name of the medicine which is prepared from scallop is pectin, P E C. T E N. Now, pectin is another very useful remedy which I use in my uh, pediatric practice because pectin is a very nice remedy when a children, young small children get asthma from humid climate, from humid weather. Now, the asthma in pectin is a very characteristic asthma. It starts with a running nose. It starts with a running nose. And then from the running nose, it goes down, trickles down into the throat and the attack starts of asthma. So what you call is a descending coriza. So in descending coriza, leading to asthma in young children with hum in humid weather. This is very important, the humid weather, pectin or scallops. You can start, start in 30th potency. Now this case is, you will see a lot in America. Then I, you can use this small remedy. Another is epomorphin. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of the word morphine. So this is what is known as a epomorphin. It's an alkaloid. This I use in excessive nausea or constant nausea with excessive vomiting. Now this I use after chemotherapy. You know, uh, after chemotherapy one develops various complications of uh, the gastric mucosa leading to nausea, vomiting, no appetite. Apomorphine is one such remedy which will really help you. Another remedy for such situation after chemotherapy is Okubaka. Do you know this remedy, Okubaka? Okay. Okay. I have not heard of that remedy, no. No? no? Okay. I think so. It is in our radar also. So uh, you can... Uh, How do you spell it again, Okubaka? O K O U B A K A Okay Okubaka uh, and another is natrum cacodil. Another remedy is natrum cacodil. It is a cacodil of sodium. So natrum cacodil is these are the three remedies I use for uh, nausea, vomiting, and gastric irritation of chemotherapy. I'm sure thousands of patients will be undergoing chemotherapy in USA, and they will come to you, that doctor, do something with homeopathy, and sure. try to help us out this, uh, you know. Sure. 
and and in, in a in a sim, simple remedy like this, you know, will will take away most of the problem. That's right. Okay, then let's go to another remedy, aconite ferox. Hmm. This is a very very useful remedy for those people whose coronary arteries are absolutely blocked, and these people get very poor oxygen for the cardiac muscles, and for some reason or the other, you cannot operate on them, either because they are too old or they are of high surgical risk. You know, there are every and any patient cannot be operated for angioplasty, you know very well. There are certain risk factors. So if a person has got a very high risk factor and you cannot, this is a very nice remedy. Aconite ferox, where there is a severe cardiac dyspnea, rapid respiration person has to sit up severe anxiety with suffocation and person feels that his respiratory muscles are going to be paralyzed so he he is very much worried and anxious but this excessive dyspnea has to sit up just cannot lie down just cannot take even one step now this I have also found in many cases of uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. It's a very, very bad disease, you know. Primary pulmonary hypertension, very common in females. You don't get this disease more in males. Where a person has to live with oxygen. So he has to carry oxygen wherever he goes because there is no treatment in modern medicine for this condition. Now if you really want to help such patients like primary pulmonary hypertension, Aconite ferox is the remedy for such patients. It will really give them good relief. Many well, times do, in my ward... do one more remedy because we're running short on time. So do one more interesting one for us, and, I, and we'll, we'll do another one of these calls in the near future. Okay. Uh, which uh, remedy? Uh, hmm. Okay, I will tell you something which I use it very frequently in my wards, you know, with anginal pains. Many people get anginal pain in the hospital, you know, and then... We always do challenge the doctors that whether homeopathy acts faster to relieve the anginal pain or the modern medicine of what is known as sublingual nitrate. And you know, Kim, what we give? We straight away give bryonia mother tincture two drops. Really? You just put two drops of bryonia mother tincture on any anginal patient, any, and you will see the miraculous effect. And this is not my hint. Right. This hint has been given by Dr. Constantine Herring. Mm -hmm. Herring in his condensed material medica has mentioned this. So I'm straightforward lifting that statement and telling you. And I have confirmed it repeatedly. Same thing goes for another very good hint which I see in Herring, which can be useful for many people, is the pain in the abdomen. Herring mentioned that if there is any pain in the abdomen and you cannot understand, purchase a mother tincture of veretrum virid, Dilute it into 1 is to 30%, 1 drop of veretrum virid, 30 drops of water, and just apply it on the abdomen with a piece of cloth. The pain will reduce tremendously. Very interesting. Mm. So well, this is... Baroque, as always, yeah. your, your <laughs> wealth of information. And yeah. So uh, before I open it up for uh, the general uh, participants to ask yeah. uh, questions, let me just let people know, uh, obviously you can tell that Dr. Master has a, uh, a vast knowledge of homeopathy, and for those of you who've never had an opportunity to actually study with him live, I can't recommend it highly enough. He's just hes one of the true treasures that we have in homeopathy. He is, uh, for those of you who have an opportunity to go and see him, he is coming to North America and will be teaching a seminar entitled Development in the Pediatric Mind, um, and that's going to be on February 26th and 27th. Uh, if you want more info, that's going to be in Ottawa, uh, Ontario. And for those of you who want more information, you can contact um, the British Institute of Homeopathy uh, at 613-749-9762. That's 613-749-9762. Or if they would prefer to send an email, they can send it to director, D-I-R-E-C-T-O-R, -E at D-I-H Canada, D-I-H Boy, I H Canada. C A director at B I H Canada. C A. Uh, Doctor Master will also be coming to New York City 
uh, and uh, offering a seminar on March 4th, 5th, and 6th. This will be in New York City at the Maya School of Homeopathy. And if you want more information about that, you can call 973-334-9094. That's 973-334-9094. Or you can email them at Maya, M-A-Y-A, office at optonline.net. That's O P T O N L I N E dot net. That's my office at Opton O P T O N L I N E dot net. And the first uh, day of that, the March fourth part of that seminar will actually be a live clinic where you'll have an opportunity to actually see Dr. Master work. And uh again, if you don't have an opportunity to go to India and study with him directly this is a, a real opportunity. Um, I know I have sent many, many different, recommended many different people, uh, friends and, and students, to go to India and study with Dr. Master, and pretty much everyone's come back and told me that it was the, the single most rewarding experience that they've had in homeopathy, educational rewarding experience that they've had in homeopathy. Dr. Master, if people do want to come and study with you in India and join your clinic, uh, how, how would they contact you to do that? They have to email to me on my email address. Okay, can you just uh, let everybody know what that is? Yeah, my email address is hhc at vsnl dot com. H- I repeat, yeah, hhc at vsnl dot com. V S Victor Nancy Sam Larry dot com. Okay, yeah. very good. Well, that's excellent. And again, uh, if you you know, going to so Dr. Master in Bombay is a, a, a one in a lifetime experience. If you can't go to India, by all means, try to go see him in Ottawa or New York. Also, uh, uh, Allison Burden, who usually joins us for these calls, uh, was going to offer a special discount on all of Dr. Master's books. So for those of you who are interested, uh, you can go to the Whole Health Now website. That's W H O L E Health H E A L T H now n o w dot com and then it would be forward slash books or just go to the book section from the home page and uh, when you're ordering any of Dr. Master's books if you type in 22-33 before February 15th that's 22-33 before February 15th if you type that into the um, comments box you will get a 22% discount on all of his titles from Europe and a 33% discount on all of his titles from India so um, you can either go to the website, wholehealthnow.com forward slash book, or you can call them toll free, toll free at 866-599-5950 and let them know that you were on the call and that you want the 2233 discount. Okay, so again, Dr. Master, thank you so much. Let me open up the lines and let people ask their own questions. One second. So are there any anybody on who'd like to ask any questions? Uh, what were the remedies after apomorphine? The telephone got blocked out. B- between apomorphine and natrium co- cocodio. Okubaka. Sorry? Okubaka. How do you spell that? O K U B A C A. B A C A. Yeah. O A U B A C A. O K U. <clears throat> o for orange, K for kangaroo, A for apple, Okubaka. Ah, Okubaka. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Thank it's you. a funny name. Very funny name. <laughs> it's a funny name. And is I missed the one for I missed the one for anginal pains. The name of the remedy? Bryonia madatincha. Bryony. 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 R Y O N I A. Yeah. What about the second? You put that on the chest? You put the bryonia on the chest? No, no, just give two drops on the tongue. But only mother tincture? Yes, only mother tincture. That's what herring says. And I have verified this. Is is bryonia alba? Yes. Okay. And was it a separate remedy for the pain in the abdomen besides the bryonia? No, I never said for pain in the abdomen bryonia. I said veritrum virid. Uh, can you spell that, please? Yeah. V E R A T R U M Viridrum Virid. V I R I D E. 1 to 30 dilution apply on abdomen? No, no, no. Use a mother tincture. Buy a mother tincture, Viridrum Virid. Dilute it with water in 1 is to 30. Yes. 
and then put the piece of cloth in the abdomen. Right, right. Got it. Got Good. it. Other questions? How do you spell the second word after the aconite remedy? Ferox. F E double R O X. Thank you. And you have to give the aconite ferox in low potency? Yes, start with six. Good. Other questions? <laughs> Would that be a good remedy for someone who's aspirated on their vomit and it now has to be on an oxygen tank the rest of their life? Yes, yes, you can use it. Thank you. And I have a question on a patient um, that's 73 years old. He's got 20% heart function.